three, hit the yellow alert. Fire department, yes, it's tornado warning. Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel. My name is Carly. Every one of us here has a tornado event or outbreak that defines their generation. For many of us, myself included, that's the 2011 super outbreak. For others, it might be the 1964 Palm Sunday tornadoes. And for those before our time, it was the 1884 Enigma outbreak. Despite the 2011 super outbreak having just happened over a decade ago, and it's still very fresh in our minds as our generation's worst tornado outbreak, nothing compares to the sheer violence, magnitude, and lasting implications of the 1974 super outbreak. In just 24 hours between April 3rd and April 4th of 1974, 148 tornadoes would pass through 13 states, 95 of which were F2+, taking the lives of over 300 and inflicting injuries to thousands. Which makes this technically the second largest tornado outbreak on record in the United States by quantity of tornadoes, only second to the 2011 super outbreak. But the 1974 super outbreak isn't really known for the volume of tornadoes that it produced. It's known for its ferocity. In its 24-hour period of producing 148 tornadoes, the Jumbo Outbreak produced 30 violent tornadoes. So today we're going to dissect this outbreak, take a look at its most notable tornadoes and their direct impacts, and then we're going to talk about how the 1974 super outbreak ultimately changed meteorology and show you why April 3rd, 1974 truly is the outbreak of the century. In the days leading up to what would become the most prolific tornado outbreak of the 20th century, a low pressure system develops in the West on April 1st, 1974. This low pressure system, particularly powerful for early spring, approaches central Kansas as a 981 millibar system. At the same time, an unusually warm air mass is rising from the Gulf of Mexico into the southern states, creating ample instability out ahead of the system. By April 2nd, strong southerly winds aloft are progressing through the eastern United States, causing quite an extreme and pronounced area of wind shear. With these kind of intense ingredients present, meteorologists are already well aware that this is likely going to cause some kind of severe weather. Local forecasters begin preparing their viewing area for what could be some intense weather on April 3rd, but what they couldn't expect was just how violent and unforgiving these storms would be. So by the morning of April 3rd, local meteorologists and forecast offices are already beginning to issue weather watches for severe storms and possible tornadoes to come for the rest of the day. Severe weather is already firing off early in the morning, which a lot of you will remember is eerily reminiscent to the 2011 outbreak, how powerful it was early in the morning. This is exactly how the 1974 outbreak started out. Very early and clearly poised to be a very dangerous day. At 9.30 in the morning, the first tornado touches down in an open field in Indiana. By early afternoon, as the turbulence grows, the watches and warnings are coming thick and fast. Tornadoes are hitting Tennessee, Georgia, Ohio, two in Illinois, two more in Indiana. 
It's now noon on April 3rd, 1974. Three separate squall lines are forming off the low pressure system in an incredibly ripe atmosphere. One squall line from Virginia to North Georgia and Alabama, the second squall line from Indiana to Tennessee, and the third from Illinois to Missouri, all of which have already been causing problems. Powerful, dangerous supercells are forming out ahead of the squall lines and getting ready to produce. Shortly after 2 p.m., a tornado forms and touches down in Lincoln, Illinois, from the first squall line. Ten minutes later, another tornado forms. These weren't the first tornadoes of the day, nor were they the most notable, but these twisters touching down was the point of no return. The outbreak was officially underway. In Louisville, upriver, an alarm sounds in the newsroom at WHAS, the local emergency broadcast station. Jeff, we got a tornado warning. Give me the emergency action cartridge. I gave a lot of thought as to how I should present all of this information. I'm going to sort of go state by state or region by region and talk about their most notable twisters. So just keep that in mind as we move forward. It's not going to be chronological, um, but rather a sort of discussion on some of the worst. So. We're going to start off in Alabama where some of the most intense and long track tornadoes would occur. And we're starting off with a really violent twister. Tanner, Alabama. It's 6 p.m. in Alabama, and the first squall of storms has crossed into the Ohio Valley. And despite having already caused problems with multiple other twisters, things are about to get even worse. Storms are only continuing to develop ahead of the squall line in discrete supercells, and one of those discrete supercells is getting ready to produce. And by 6.30 p.m. in Lawrence County, Alabama, it finally produces and touches down. A hook echo indicating tornado activity has now located over in northern Lawrence County. A tornado is on the ground at Langtown, or 26 miles west of the city of Huntsville, taking everything along as it goes. In Huntsville, Civil Defense Director Harris Mitchell already has the emergency operating center on alert. Give it to Philip and have him plot it on, on the map. Mr. Wise, we put the warning out again. The twister begins near the rural areas of Mount Hope. And because this storm system is moving so fast, many of these storms can move between 50 and 60 miles per hour. People barely have time to even recognize what's happening by the time they're already getting hit. Mike, uh, we just, this thing is spotted and it's coming up the Tennessee River and possibly now will cross somewhere around uh, the Tennessee River Bridge. So, it evidently is moving up the south end of uh, what we'd call our county. So the people in there needs to uh, be alert and, and take some type of cover. So just a few minutes later, the twister is already in Mount Moriah, where the intensity and width of the twister only continues to grow. Tragically, in this area, an entire family of six would lose their life in their home as well. Okie dokie, here's uh, Spencer Black, Civil Defense Department. Mike? Yeah. Yes, thank Mike, you. Yeah. Put uh, everybody around town and Ripley Air and everything to get anywhere they possibly can because the hook is down within the river around the Brownsbury area now. They just got to take cover. Bobby Ray, I hear near East Limestone School, the tornado between 72 Highway and Nick Davis Highway moving east, going toward East Limestone School. The twister only continues to track through multiple rural areas before crossing the Tennessee River into Limestone County, flattening trees on either side of the bank and plastering red river mud onto the remaining trunks of the debarked trees. And it's at this point in the twister's life, after having been on the ground for quite some time, that it finally reaches the small town of Tanner. And unfortunately, this would end up becoming one of the most notable areas of damage in the entirety of the 1974 outbreak was this poor community of Tanner being hit. A tornado is visible here at the airport. Projected path next few minutes will put it in the Harvest, Tony, Meridianville, Hazel Green areas of the county. We got a spot and headed our way.
From the pictures, you can see the remains of the homes, many of which were from Lawson's trailer park that are just strewn about. Even well-built homes in many cases that were just absolutely laid flat. A picture that is sort of encapsulates the violence of this storm and it's a bathtub that is found plunged very deeply into the ground very strange almost inconceivable things uh, sometimes reality is stranger than fiction when it comes to these tornadoes after 90 minutes the tanner twister finally lets up in madison county after moving through harvest the searchers find three victims, a mother and her two small children. Their bodies blown and tumbled a quarter mile through the muddy fields. A grieving father, still alive, but with a broken back. Got a big fall spotted north and off a big one. I can hear it now. Georgia. We find nobody in the wreckage, so we'll go on up Stewart Road, where we are headed towards where supposedly five people are uh, entrapped and they're going to use a wrecker to pull them out. Uh, goodness gracious, alive. Would you look at the trees? It is unreal. Trees are everywhere. Man. 28 lives were lost in this one single F5 rated tornado that had an estimated width of 500 yards. And this would be one of seven F5s that would happen on April 3rd. An F5 twister has just hit the community of Tanner. And I want you to sort of imagine the chaos, the confusion, the shock that everyone's feeling. There's a smell of pine and probably gas in the air. And you're scrambling to figure out if you are okay, if you're injured, or maybe it's just adrenaline, if your family or your friend across the street is okay. And in the midst of that pure chaos, the unthinkable happens. Can you see it? Can you see it? Yeah, the clouds are forming up. They're just starting to gather. That's not on the ground yet. It's not on the ground yet, but the clouds are starting to circle. Even 30 minutes after the first F5 tornado lifts, a supercell that's been ramping up on the heels of the Twister and Tanner has just touched down just to the west of the areas that have just been pummeled by this first storm. The second Twister was, as it approached Tanner, less than a mile away from the path of the first storm. Persons in trailer courts and mobile homes elsewhere are urged to evacuate and get to a place of safety. If there's anyone in there, you better take cover. There's a tornado coming. A tornado is visible here at the airport. Projected path next few minutes will put it in the Harvest, Tony, Meridianville, Hazel Green areas of the county. Now listen, folks, if you are taking this thing lightly, let me tell you something. In all my life, I have never seen nothing like this. I'm sitting here behind this microphone, my teeth chattering, scared half to death. And this is an emergency. This is a disaster. We have never had nothing like this in my lifetime in Limestone County, Alabama. You folks take cover. From roughly 735 and for the next hour, this new tornado moves through Tanner, who has just been hit and would parallel the path of the first twister moving northeast. The second twister would have an 83 mile path altogether and was estimated to be 500 yards in width. In the second twister, 16 more people would lose their life. And as you can imagine, uh, many of the structures that had made it the first round of the Tanner Twister were subsequently destroyed in the second Twister. And that also meant that tragically, some of the people who survived this first tornado, a once in a lifetime event, didn't make it through the second Twister. One man who was injured but lived through the first F5 tornado in the Lawson trailer park was taken to a church after the Twister hit and really tragically 
the second twister would hit that church and collapse and he lost his life after surviving the first once in a lifetime twister. And it certainly wasn't just Tanner that was hit. There were many other rural communities that were hit as well. And I would love to be able to talk about every single one of them, but there's just so much to cover with these. The death toll between the two twisters that moved through Tanner combined had a fatality total of 44 with over 400 injuries. Both of the twisters, of course, were given F5 ratings because of their ferocity and very apparent violent damage. We're going to continue with Alabama and now take a look at another F5 in Guin, Alabama. Although all of the F5s on April 3rd were, of course, very intense, there's something different about the Guin, Alabama tornado. Um, and that is not just my opinion, that has been reiterated by multiple scientists and people who surveyed this twister. Just after 8.30 p.m., near the Mississippi and Alabama border, near the town of Vernon, one supercell of the countless that were spawned on April 3rd produces. The twister first strikes rural communities of Caledonia and Flint Hill, and while most of the path of this twister in the first part of its life would be in rural areas, but unfortunately this twister wouldn't stay in rural areas forever. Just as the twister reaches about F5 or peak intensity, it reaches the town of Guin. And not only is it nighttime, which means people probably aren't going to see the twister, it's also incredibly fast moving, meaning people, once they realize what's happening, have a lot less time to get into shelter safely. The damage that occurred in Guin was deemed by Dr. Ted Fujita, who surveyed this area himself as some of the most intense tornado damage he has ever surveyed in his entire career, which tells you something. Of the structures that were hit in Guin was the Guin Mobile Home Plant and surrounding buildings, which were completely torn apart and left with nothing but a pile of crumpled beams. Homes and businesses in this few block radius of Guin in the downtown region were just really reduced to nothing. Well-built businesses and homes that were completely tore up, cars tossed. And finally, just before the twister enters the extremely populated areas of Huntsville, it finally lifts. Uh, couldn't advise if there's any injuries. We've had one slide injury out of here. Now, unfortunately, a separate F3 would actually move through Huntsville shortly after the F5. Um, and it did take three more lives, but it was a good thing that the Guin tornado didn't move through Huntsville because it was an incredibly intense storm. Overall, uh, just a really horrific outbreak for the state of Alabama. As usual, they very strangely seem to always get the worst, most violent and long track twisters in these events. It's very strange. There was a Native American legend passed down by the Shawnee Indians, a tribe that occupied much of the Ohio River Valley, who long ago referred to the area in the southwestern corner of Ohio as Land of the Devil Wind or Land of Crazy Wind. And it's that exact region in southwestern Ohio that would later become Xenia. Radar report indicates a possible tornado sighted 25 miles northeast of Cincinnati. Be moving to the northeast at approximately 50 miles an hour. Roger, let's try the 25 miles. Shortly after 4.30 p.m. on April 3rd, a call is made from the WSO office in Chicago to Dayton, Ohio, to make sure that the meteorologists in Dayton are also seeing this storm that they are on the radar with a pretty nasty looking hook echo. Meteorologists know that this can only mean something bad's about to happen. Is it touching the ground? I can not touch down now. Oh, 
severe, massive storm. The track indicated by the hook in our radar screen is now moving into the city of Xenia. Persons in the city of Xenia and along the track just south of it, Arrowhead, Xenia, Central State, should take cover immediately. Now moving at 50 miles per hour, the supercell continues to gain momentum, and just a few minutes after 4.40 p.m., a twister touches down near Lower Bellbrook Road. Immediately, the storm is already battering the neighborhoods of Windsor Park and Arrowhead. The tornado is already frighteningly strong, and the trajectory is, of course, putting it towards Xenia. And while some might be actively aware of what's going on, whether someone called them, whether they are listening to the radio or TV by chance, there were no tornado sirens in Xenia at all. The tornado, now visible by those in the town, is seen by Gil Whitney, the weather specialist for the WHIO in Dayton. He immediately alerts his viewers, and fortunately, he was able to get the message out several minutes before Xenia was actually hit. In the newsroom at station WHIO, weatherman Gil Whitney is watching his radar. That's what I think it is. We better do something about it, Skip. Cameras to the studio. Cameras to the studio. Here's a weather bulletin from WHIO's instant weather radar station. Instant weather radar now shows a tornado developing in northeastern Warren County. The tornado, now a large, very menacing multi-vortex, is moving through the western portion of Xenia, Ohio. Students at the Xenia High School are practicing for a play, largely unaware that anything's going on outside at all. But moments later, the school starts to shake and wind gets louder and louder. The students quickly realize that something probably bad is happening outside and quickly get into the hallway just in time. Seconds later, as the tornado is now closing in on the school, suddenly a school bus that the tornado has actually been carrying drops through the roof and onto the stage where the kids had just been practicing for their play. In just a few minutes time, the Xenia High School had been largely destroyed. And the school bus wasn't the only massive thing that the Xenia Twister picks up. The Twister was so powerful that it actually picked up several railroad cars from Penn Central's railroad station and tossed those about as well. After moving over the Xenia High School and several well-built homes, the Xenia Twister now moves on to the downtown and business district of Xenia. The downtown blocks took a direct hit from the storm and unfortunately several lives were lost in businesses and caused the highest single building fatality count from a tornado ever in the state of Ohio. And as if things couldn't get any worse for the area, it's actually at this point that power goes out at the local National Weather Service office along with the news station, CBG, and their communication with the general public and with each other was essentially cut off. After traveling roughly 30 miles with a maximum estimated width of about half a mile, the Twister finally exits Xenia. In minutes, an emergency medical convoy is assembling outside the base hospital, and a heavy construction battalion is also being dispatched to Xenia. Attention Box 21, attention Box 21. 
Dick, I've got to get a hold of the hospital and find out whether they can handle any more patients. Can you contact them? Yes, sir, and will do. 35 East Bounds fire. Both City Hall and County Courthouse are wrecked, and there is no emergency operating center equipped to deal with this kind of crisis. In total, 32 would lose their lives in the Xenia tornado, and in the coming days, two more Two Ohio National Air Guardsmen lost their lives in a fire while doing disaster assistance. So the official total for the Xenia Twister is 34. On top of that, over 1,150 injuries are recorded in Xenia, many of which we note were people who did shelter properly. And that's really just a testament to the fact that this storm was incredibly violent. In total, 1,400 plus buildings were damaged or destroyed, half of which were in Xenia alone. Windsor Park and Arrowhead subdivisions that we mentioned earlier were both hit at F5 intensity, and with the number of fatalities being 34, Xenia was the deadliest individual tornado of the entire outbreak. On top of being the deadliest and one of the most violent twisters of this entire outbreak, the Xenia tornado cost roughly $100 million in damage in 1974, which is the equivalent of very roughly half a billion dollars today. Ted Fujita himself said in his survey of the storm that the damage in Xenia was so bad that he felt it deserved to have not an F5 rating, but an F6 rating which equates to, according to Dr. Ted Fujita, the inconceivable tornado or unfathomable damage. And we'll talk about that a little bit more when we look at the survey. So knowing everything we know about Xenia now, it does strike me as a little odd that the Native American tribes would name Xenia, rightfully so, the land of Devil Wind. Roughly an hour after the tragedy in Xenia, Yet another tragic twister is about to unfold, only this time in the Cincinnati Metro. And incredibly at this time in the outbreak, up to 16 tornadoes were on the ground at the same time. Around 5.30 p.m., meteorologists are beginning to notice yet another hook echo show up on radar, only this time in the extreme southeastern portions of Indiana. Shortly after the hook echo shows up on radar, Twister touches down near Rising Sun, Indiana, just after 5.40. It is a funnel cloud. It looks to be about 200 feet off. No, now it is touching the ground. What is it doing now? Heading directly toward Hamilton County. Now, this tornado is unique for several reasons. This twister, unlike many others, was actually on TV as WCPO began broadcasting the tornado in a special coverage of the storms. Thousands of people tuned in live to watch this tornado unfold. A huge funnel rips across the Ohio River passes just west of Cincinnati, roars on through Hamilton County. The twister after crossing over the river and into the state of Kentucky is now moving through Boone County where it's immediately already producing F4 damage. One of the things here that uh, sort of took people aback was the fact that this twister crossed over the river into Kentucky. Many people didn't think that it could, and it certainly did. Just after crossing the Ohio River a second time, the twister is now reaching peak F5 intensity, and now it's moving towards Sailor Park, Ohio. And the images of Sailor Park and the tornado itself much like Xenia are incredibly haunting to look at. And while they were all pretty menacing, I do have to say the fact that they were really visible was truly a silver lining in this event because it meant that in places where people didn't have tornado sirens like in Xenia, you could see this thing coming from a mile away. And that 
in my opinion, really could have been the saving grace for a lot of people who may not have otherwise been paying attention. Just after it had crossed the river a second time, the Moorhead Marina is hit first. Numerous boats are thrown. Houses on the riverside are ripped from their foundation and thrown into the river. Now moving into the Cincinnati metropolitan region, neighborhoods including Bridgetown, Mack, Dent, and Delhi, and Sailor Park, all in upper echelon F4 and F5 intensity damage. The twister finally dissipates near White Oak, but the supercell was only recycling and unfortunately would ultimately go on to produce several more tornadoes in Lebanon and Mason. But for Sailor Park and surrounding regions, the damage was already done. Three lives were lost and over 200 injuries were confirmed. A tornado warning has been issued for part of Kentuckiana. WHAS now transmits a tone to activate special receivers. And now we're going to switch gears a little bit and move on to talk about Kentucky briefly. 3.25 p.m. this twister touches down in Breckenridge County in Kentucky, first producing F3 damage in the Hardinsburg area to homes and becoming increasingly violent as it moves into Meade County. Another sighted near Hardinsburg, Kentucky, heading toward Brandenburg, a sleepy little river town 25 miles southwest of Louisville. At the radio station, just west of town, announcer Bill Byrne receives a telephone call telling of its coming. The only warning, a last second shout. At that point, F4 damage is starting to occur in portions of Irvington homes where vehicles are thrown and mangled. And this, at this point, it's also reported that the tornado left no grass on the side of the roads as it crossed Kentucky Route 79. And shortly after moving through Irvington, this is the point at which the twister now moves into Bradenburg at F5 intensity. Brandenburg. It looked like this in the morning. We had a tornado. That's, that would be the understatement of the year. Oh my goodness, it just popped and cracked. It's like a uh, hundred thousand tons of bombs dropping. The wind are blowing everywhere in the world so strong. Saw what I thought to be smoke and stuff coming up over the hill, but it was a black cloud or wind, dirt and everything coming up over the hill. And it just hit and that's it. Well-built homes swept away, foundations pulled up, Pretty unconceivable damage here as well. Cars are thrown, windrows stripped bark, a curtain rod was found pierced through a tree, tombstones were broken off. Any inkling or indicator of violent twister damage that we've ever talked about was here in Brandenburg in Kentucky. In Brandenburg, with no sirens, no weather wire, 31 dead. In Xenia, 33. In Louisville, Cincinnati, Huntsville, the story was different. They had warning, planning, emergency operating centers. In total, this tornado carved a 32 mile path and in the state of Kentucky, 70 lives would be lost in this outbreak, 31 of which were from the Bradenburg F5 alone, which is a pretty large number considering that it mostly went through rural areas. The last big twister has ripped through Redstone Arsenal, leveled a trailer village. Louisville. All night long, Bob Stewart and his staff will be improvising desperately, trying to bring the situation under control. Boone, we have perimeter control established around the entire city now with 26 points. Is that right, Chief? That's right. Do you have any complaints of looting yet, Chief, or anything? I've had just a few, but they're minor so far. Great. And rescue workers are moving through the night, searching for injured. 
and bodies. So in the coming hours and days after this major outbreak, you can imagine how chaotic the entire scene is. And it's almost unfathomable, right? The amount of destruction so far and wide. And frankly, even like on this channel, I don't think the descriptions can ever do justice to seeing that kind of damage in person or having it happen to someone you know. Nothing can compare to the emotions that someone would feel having experienced it. There's no way I can really talk in depth accurately about the entirety of the rescue operations and injuries, not only because we're talking about a massive outbreak, but also because every single town's story was so different. Normally, when we talk about a singular event, we can kind of really hone in and talk about exactly what the rescue process looked like. We can talk about exactly how people started to rebuild, but I can't do that here. In total, there would be 319 fatalities in the April 3rd through 4th tornadoes with almost 6,000 injuries. The presidents declared 10 states to be major disaster areas, eligible for federal assistance in all its many forms. One-stop disaster centers are set up to handle home, farm, and small business loans, food stamps, shelter, trailers, and other temporary housing. All right, so we're going to discuss a little bit what details we do have on the recovery process. I'm just mostly going to stick to Xenia because that's what I was able to find the most information on. Xenia had very quickly decided that rebuilding was a tangible goal. In the coming days after the outbreak, President Richard Nixon actually visited Xenia after the devastation. And very shortly after having visited Xenia, he declared it a disaster area. And help is coming from every direction. Red Cross, Salvation Army, all the military services, Corps of Engineers, the National Guard, to clean up and restore essential services. Rescue squads from hundreds of miles away, volunteers of every kind. What a mess. What a mess. There were a lot of fundraisers, there were committees, there were a lot of people that came forward to immediately get right back to the way Xenia was before it was destroyed. Bob Hope, who was a famous comedian, organized a benefit for Xenia as well and raised money for the new high school. And in turn, the new high school auditorium was named after him. It's called the Bob Hope Auditorium. And we mentioned the fact that Xenia didn't have tornado sirens before the Twister. And you can bet that Xenia immediately put in tornado sirens as one of the first things they did in the recovery process. By May, the president had signed amendments into the Disaster Relief Act of 1974 to now include tornado recovery as well, which was huge and something that Xenia did benefit from. Well, I'll tell you, I've uh, restored my faith in mankind with everybody. There's always so much talk about people, they don't care about each other. No way. There's no way. These people over here bust their backs. Money, anything you want. If I took all the offers that people gave me, I'd be a millionaire. And so for Xenia specifically, with the help of federal aid, with the help from locals, people from out of state, out of county, several months after the tornado, Xenia was recovering as best as it could given its circumstances. And within the next year, much of Xenia was rebuilt. And that is incredible. The amount of people that came together to put in the work to rebuild Xenia was unreal. Just six months ago, this neighborhood looked like Hiroshima. 
but this block has been rebuilt and many others like it. To date, just six months later, more than 50% of the tornado victims are back in Xenia, living in their permanent homes. Xenia got enough money to open schools on schedule. Some students are in temporary modular classrooms. High school and junior high school students are using the same school on a split session basis. But most Xenia children are back in Xenia schools. The fact that there was so much media attention on Xenia meant that it got a lot more, I hate to say it, but it got a lot more aid in terms of the funding that came, in terms of the volunteers that came, in terms of the money, private and public donations that were made. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing at all. Uh, but, but when you look at the greater context of the fact that there were a lot of rural areas that were hit by F5 twisters that didn't get as much attention, that didn't get as much help. I don't know. It's, it's hard to say what the right or wrong in this kind of situation, but it, it also, this kind of reminds me of the 2011 outbreak as well, where you had really well covered and documented recovery processes like the Tuscaloosa storm. And then you had areas of, let's say, Hackleburg and Phil Campbell that we've talked about on this channel that didn't get the same resources and attention and money that, let's say, Tuscaloosa did. I'm going to leave that for you to make your own decisions on. Because the 1974 outbreak was so prolific, we're going to talk about the surveys and subsequent changes that this outbreak brought on. Dr. Ted Fujita and a survey team embarked on a 10 month long journey to survey all the storms from the April 3rd and 4th, 1974 outbreak. So within these studies, I'm only going to point out the most notable aspects, things that I find to be notable. And I'll start off with the one that gets the most attention. Was Xenia rated an F6? And what is an F6 tornado? Originally, the Fujita scale was created with Alan Pearson, who was head of the NSSFC at the time, which is the National Weather Service today to give a more accurate representation of tornado intensity and the damage that they cause. Originally, the scale was designed to be 13 categories ranging from F0 to 12 as a way to connect the Beaufort scale and the Mach number. But after being adopted, it was subsequently changed to be a six range scale from F0 to F5, hypothetically the F6 tornado being the highest tier in what would be categorized as the impossible tornado or inconceivable damage. And that was what Dr. Ted Fujita felt that the Xenia damage was, inconceivable. Of course, we know now that Xenia was given an F5 rating, but it's just really interesting to know that Dr. Ted Fujita really thought that it should be given the name of an impossible tornado in F6. One of the other really interesting parts of this outbreak is the anomalous nature of how many violent tornadoes it produced, of course, and also because it produced a striking number of left turn tornadoes. And according to this survey, left turn tornadoes are more intense statistically than their right turn tornado counterparts. 43 of 65 tornadoes with a 10 mile path or longer were left turn tornadoes in this event. And on top of all of this science and data collected, the team was able to discover things they didn't previously know about tornadoes. And in fact, this was actually the first time that downburst and microburst were actually discovered and studied as well. We have some unfinished business. So what happened after this outbreak? Let's take a look at the short and long-term impacts. Despite the widespread devastation, this event did serve as a sort of catalyst for positive change in the weather community. Because of Xenia's widespread devastation, Congress passed the Disaster Relief Act of 1974, which amended a previous version and expanded the assistance the government could provide to individuals and communities, and now included relief from tornadoes. After the power outages at the Weather Service office during this outbreak, changes were made to not only now have power backup generators at weather offices, but to amend a lot of the previous protocols so that should one office go down in operations, another one is swiftly able to pick up. And the Fujita scale, which was previously accepted, was now officially adopted as the nationwide official damage rating scale. And of course, the funding. 
funding towards the National Weather Service and programs in meteorology was significantly increased from the federal government after this outbreak. And it's a little unfortunate that it took such a major devastating event for the government to start funding the National Weather Service a little bit more, but better late than never, I guess. To me, this is really reminiscent of back in the late 1940s when the word tornado was still banned from being broadcast. And it wasn't until tornadoes hit Tinker Air Force Base in 1948, one after another, that the government chose to accept that meteorologists' work in tornado forecasting was really important and to lift the ban on the word tornado. And I kind of get that same feeling with the 74 outbreak. Of course, new funding opened up a lot of different doors. It allowed for weather offices who didn't previously have a radar to now have one so that not one office is having to cover an expansive area. It allowed for research programs. It supported tornado intercept projects. And all of these were just the short-term changes, which were huge, but the impacts didn't stop there. The funding that went to meteorological services subsequently led to a great benefit in the weather enterprise. And most notably, of course, I'm talking about the newer Doppler radars. Scientists really spent the entirety of the 80s working to develop and test a better version, which we know now to be the next ride radars that were finally operational in 1992 and completely revolutionized the field. Now, this wouldn't be one of my videos unless I talked about the psychological impacts of this event, so let's talk about that for a second. Of course, the very preliminary impact here was that a lot of people were traumatized. It was just a big roar, and I, I don't know. It was just terrible. It sounded like a big train whistle, and we were right underneath the front of it. I've, I've never seen anything like it, and I don't want to again. If you come and you see your home, and two seconds later, it's all grown. Just a nightmare. Just a nightmare. It's impossible for me to fully encapsulate and tell you just how many people were mentally altered after this event. We didn't get a chance to talk too in depth about the fatalities and injuries in this event, but let me take the chance now to tell you that because some 300 people died in this event, that now meant that thousands of people were missing a sibling or a parent or a child or a friend. Those 6,000 plus who were injured during this tornado outbreak who made it with their life, some now had to live life without a limb, some with scars to remind them for the rest of their lives. And I personally think this was likely a wake-up call for a lot of people to take these kind of storms seriously and to not underestimate them because we're still talking about a lot of people who believe that tornadoes can't go into mountains or they can't go over the river or they can't move into valleys into these protected regions and because of this outbreak a lot of people realize that that's not true and that's why i always make such a point to take time to talk about the mental impacts of severe weather events especially tornadoes because these events aren't over after the tornado lifts these events aren't even over after the town completely rebuilds these people live with this event for the rest of their lives it's not as simple as the tornado lifting and the town rebuilding it's so much more than that homes can be rebuilt belongings can always be replaced but i promise you the people who lived through the april 3rd 1974 outbreak are never ever going to forget it i i just hope to god next time somebody listens and then there's a tornado warning out I know they will around here. This has been a really long video. I hope y'all are doing okay after this one. It's been a lot. It's been intense. I would love to know what you all think about this event as well. Please leave me your comments down below as you always do. And I always really appreciate them. That's all. Yeah, that's it everybody. Thank you so much for being here and I will see you very soon. Bye. If it isn't Mr. Blaze. Oh, I caught a rat. Say hello. Pinkies out, ladies! <laughs> Greetings, present. La 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 la. Maybe we should do those now, thanks.